All right. Uh, lots to dig into there. And of course, I want to get into uh, the world of currencies with you because you write about that uh, all the time with your role there at Gold Money. Um, let me just ask a couple clarifying questions first, though, just for my own curiosity. Uh, it sounds like, from at least for the Western players here, um, and most of our viewers here are from the West, not all, but, but a lot of them are. Um, I, I look at what you're sort of predicting, this credit crunch, which obviously is contractionary uh, to economic growth, uh, the potential for commodities to start becoming more uh, scarce and more expensive, especially if things continue to escalate uh, in Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, I'm putting aside how bad things could get if the, the war really escalates, and let's hope it doesn't. Um, but when I kind of connect the dots that you were putting out there, I, I was sort of hearing stagflation. Um, do you sort of predict stagflation for the West here? Yes, um, inevitably that is the case. And I think the best way to understand it is uh, to point out that um, in every fiat currency collapse, um, you know, it, it's been stagflation in the sense that um, when you get an economic collapse, um, obviously the economy goes downhill very rapidly in terms of its real output. Um, but um, GDP might appear to rise. Why? Because the purchasing power of the currency you're measuring it in, in is collapsing. And um, so that, I think, is a situation which potentially we could well face. And the thing that would, is likely to drive it really, I think, is the position of the dollar. Uh, this meeting um, uh, in Johannesburg for BRICS and uh, people who are interested in joining BRICS, countries that are interested in, in joining BRICS, uh, has the potential, I think, to begin to undermine the dollar as a reserve currency. Now, when it does that, then it becomes more difficult for uh, uh, the US government to fund its deficit um, because foreigners will no longer be interested in maintaining large dollar positions. And um, that position is extremely large. I mean, if you look at, uh, according, and this is US Treasury tick figures, if you look at the um, bank deposits uh, uh, due to uh, foreign entities, I mean, that's something like 6 trillion, which I think is the order of what, sort of 35, 40% of total bank deposits in the US. I mean, this is a huge, huge quantity. And then on top of that, they've also got their bond investments. Um, and uh, as well as that, they've got investments in equities. And the total exposure of foreigners is in the order of 30 to $31 trillion. In other words, somewhat more than US GDP. Uh, so you can see that um, uh, if, if something just goes wrong, if you like, as far as um, the geopolitical situation of America and the dollar's hegemony, then, you know, this could develop into quite a rout. Um, and this is, I think, a very, very serious thing, which is not recognized very much by domestic Americans. I mean, domestic Americans, quite understandably, I mean, you know, we all do this. We think our currency is perfectly safe. We don't, can't see why there's a problem with it and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, Americans also have the experience that um, their dollar is always wanted and it is used for trade. It is used to settle everything. Everything around the world is priced in dollars. It is the international currency. Um, you know, anything which is cross-border, which is not dollar, is really pretty minor and pretty local type stuff, like one country next to another dealing between them. The dollar is so important. Now, of course, I can understand this. But from the foreigner's point of view, when you've got around about, I think it's about 14 trillion invested in uh, US equities, why have you got 14 trillion invested in US equities? I mean, let's face it, it's got to be a speculative, you know, a speculative um, interest. Um, so when things turn around uh, for, the, for the dollar, I, it, it will start, I believe, with the foreigners. And I would say that in sterling, we've got exactly the same problem. Um, at the moment, um, you know, we see rising um, uh, interest rates uh, and um, from a foreign point of view, you could take the view and this is what they do at the moment, which is why sterling is held up reasonably well. Well, the yield in sterling is extremely attractive, but there will come a point when these yields begin to destabilize the UK economy. Then what do the foreigners do? They sell sterling. Of course they do. And here am I sitting as a Brit thinking, 
there's nothing wrong. I mean, sterling's all right. OK, interest rates are rising and it's difficult and all the rest of it. But, you know, I mean, surely there's no reason for the foreigners to sell our currency. You know, do you, do you, do you see what I mean? It's a, there's a sort of foreign view and there's a domestic view. And the easiest thing in the world for anyone is to accept their domestic view. So I would urge Americans to just try and look at it from the foreigner's point of view. Look at the dollar from the foreigner's point of view. It might not be quite so rosy. Uh, it's super important. Again, one of the big reasons why I have you here on this channel. And, and just to show you how quickly you can go from absolute confidence in your system to panic, uh, we just have to look back to the guilt crisis of last year, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nobody expected that the day before, right? And then all no. of a sudden it was like, whoa, wait a minute, like our entire pension system is about to implode. Yep, right? yep. And now, um, incidentally, um, you know, that yield has just topped the yield that we saw then. <laughs> you know, And is it in the headlines? Not really, but it will be, I can assure you. Uh, particularly with, um, you know, the, the, the crisis, the developing crisis in the mortgage market um, must not be underestimated. So I mean, I, I want, that was actually one of my small yeah. questions. So let's go there really quickly. So you, you, yeah. you were talking about how uh, higher rates are obviously going to be weighing mm -hmm. on over leveraged companies or highly leveraged companies. And as we're recording here, Alistair, I, I just have been running a video on Wealthion today that's focused on the quote unquote zombie corporation risk. We had a yeah. zombie corporate analyst on who's talking about exactly this issue. But you're right. There's a whole consumer side to this, right? Which is uh, what's happening in mortgages and homes frequently are most people's largest asset. Um, and the big difference I just want to make for my American viewers here is um, the, the U.S. housing market is is kind of in a, it's in sort of like a Mexican standoff right now where sellers don't want to sell, buyers don't want to buy, transactions have plummeted. And there's a lot of debate where one of the prevailing narratives is oh, our housing market's not going to correct that much because most people have a 30-year mortgage and they're just going to wait this out. You know, as long as they don't have to sell, they can just stay with their you know cheap mortgage, right? And there's a lot of truth to that. Over in the UK, though, you guys deal in five-year mortgages mostly, right? Five years fixed, and then it basically you have to take on, it either becomes variable or you go take on another five-year fixed mortgage, but of course, everything is re-rated now. So you have about 20% of your housing stock, roughly, that comes up for repricing every single year. And I imagine right now you're having people that are getting, you know, massive re-rating shock. You're nodding as I'm saying this. So so tell me what's going on there, because I feel like what's going on there is, is largely kind of a preview of what may be coming to the U.S. and other markets. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, your description of the U.S. market, um, uh, you know, is ringing bells here because uh, in terms of prices, we're in a similar position. Um, the, the market's just sort of stopped, uh, as it were. Um, transactions are stopped. Um, a few prices have been reduced by the sellers, um, but nobody knows quite where this is going. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of hope and so on and so forth. It reminds me very much of the public attitude in the early stages of a bear market in inequities, you know, where, you know, the prices have fallen. I mean, should, should, we, should we buy or, um, you know, I mean, surely things are not nearly as bad as uh, the way prices right. have gone are indicated. Right. The, the, the first stage of the five stages of grief, right? It's denial. Exactly, right. exactly, exactly. 